Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome to MIT's Faculty Forum Online. My name is Ann White. I'm the Department Head in Nuclear Science and Engineering at MIT, and I will serve as moderator today. This broadcast is sponsored in part by the MIT Federal Credit Union and MIT Professional Education. A reminder that after we hear from today's guest, we'll field your questions for him. Please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar to ask your questions. We'll get to as many as time allows. It is my pleasure to invite you to meet Jacopo Buongiorno, a PhD from the MIT class of 2001. He is the TEPCO Professor of Nuclear Science and Engineering at MIT and is the Director of Science and Technology of the MIT Nuclear Reactor Laboratory. Professor Buongiorno joined the faculty in 2004, teaching a variety of undergraduate and graduate courses in thermofluids engineering and nuclear reactor engineering. We'll post a link to his full bio in the chat. Today's talk is entitled, Nuclear Energy, the Need for Radical Innovation. Welcome, Jacopo. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to be with you and everybody else who has connected uh, for this seminar series. Indeed, I am an alum, and uh, you know this feels like I'm giving back a little bit to that community. So that's uh, that's great. So let me share screen here, and uh, we'll start with the presentation. All right, very good. So I'd like to start on a um, on a light note, um, and so. I've been using this slide um, for the longest time. I think it's um, educational. So what's shown here is so-called bathtub curve. Um, and what you have on the x-axis is time. And uh, normally here, I would ask to the audience, a live audience, what do you think is going to show up on the y-axis? And here, I'm going to end suspense quickly. It's attention, meaning your attention. So countless psychological studies have shown that uh, human attention actually behaves this way in um, uh, during a presentation. So I have your attention now at the very beginning, then you're more or less going to go into, you know, uh, sort of a sleepy mode throughout. And then at the end, when I snap my fingers and say conclusions, you'll, you'll start paying attention again. Now, jokes aside, the implication of this, of this curve is important that is I need to give you the most important message right at the beginning and then repeat them at the end and then I'll tell you a story in between for those of you who have the patience to uh, to sort of uh, follow that throughout so uh, with that in mind let me start with the takeaway messages there is essentially five of this uh, they won't all take up the same amount of time in my presentations but you'll hear them throughout. Uh, first, I'll, I'll make the case that uh, if we are in the business of decarbonizing um, the energy sector in the US and worldwide, uh, it makes sense to have nuclear in that mix. And uh, you know, I'll show you why uh, quantitatively. Um, the second point is a little bit more subtle uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, there is certainly a need for radical innovation in new nuclear technology in the US, and I would say Europe. However, there are other countries that have mastered the art of building uh, more or less traditional large light water reactor designs, countries like uh, South Korea, Russia, and China. They're very efficient suppliers of traditional large nuclear power plants. And for these countries, the need for innovation is uh, much reduced compared to the US. Nuclear is viable now, will continue to be viable in, in the coming decades, whether they innovate or not, in my opinion. Um, whether it's the US or globally, there are always opportunities for reducing cost, which is a big hurdle for the deployment or I should say expansion of, of nuclear. And this may come from a combination of smaller, simpler machines, more serially manufactured in factories or shipyards. And importantly, we've been accelerated testing and licensing. So we'll spend a little bit of time there. Um, traditionally, nuclear has been confined to the electric grid. So electricity and integrated uh, uh, nationwide uh, grid. Uh, but in fact, it turns out that new nuclear systems can serve a very diverse portfolio of valuable activities uh, that have a big impact both from a social and economical uh, point of view. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And then in passing, I also mentioned that by some kind of a miracle, we currently have a very strong bipartisan support for new nuclear energy 
um, in, in the United States. And that, of course, helps uh, with the innovation that I, will, uh, that I will discuss. So those are the takeaway messages. And now I'm going to sort of tell you the story. And let me start with this. Um, I call this the value proposition of nuclear in a low carbon world. Why are we even considering nuclear uh, in this new phase of um, uh, environmental uh, uh, awareness and, and, uh, and, and need for action in that, uh, in that context. Well, first and foremost, we are considering nuclear because it is a low carbon energy technology. This question comes up often, particularly people who are not in, into this business. They ask, okay, I understand that the operation of nuclear, there is no emission of CO2, but about all the other activities that are associated with the fuel cycle or the, the or the construction of the plant and the decommissioning and so on. So the uh, uh, these studies have been have been performed, not just for nuclear, of course, but for every possible energy uh, source that is available out there. And they have to include everything. So these are called life cycle uh, uh, evaluations. And so for nuclear, they would include construction of the plant, mining of the fuel, uh, transportation of, uh, of materials back and forth from the site, uh, operation itself, decommissioning, waste disposal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you then line up all the different uh, energy technologies in terms of grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour of energy generated, it turns out that nuclear is really a very, very low uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, even when everything is, is included. You can see there at the bottom right, uh, it's basically the same level of wind and about half of solar and uh, orders of magnitude lower than, than of course, the, the fossil, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, another big selling point for nuclear is that it's dispatchable, which means uh, you basically get your electricity or heat, your energy when you need it. Uh, there is no intermittency. And it also doesn't take up a lot of, a lot of land. So more quantitatively here, a nuclear power plant typically has a capacity factor, which means the uh, uh, effective amount of energy that is generated divided by the theoretical maximum, which is about 90% or higher. So that's astronomically high. And uh, depending on the design and, and the sites, uh, you know, it sits on roughly a square kilometers and so on. So when you do this, um, when you, you can introduce a figure of merit that effectively would be the amount of power that is generated per unit area, per unit area of land. And for nuclear is over 2000 megawatt per square kilometer. And you should compare that to alternative low carbon energy sources such as solar and wind. We know these are a lot lower density, but astronomically lower density, or almost like three order, in fact, in the case of wind, three orders of magnitude um, lower, a thousand times lower. And that comes from the fact that they physically take up a lot of land, but also from the fact that, of course, their capacity factors are very low because of the, because of the issue of intermittency. Um, so how much material is it required to build a nuclear power plant? And how does that compare to other energy sources? Again, the answer here is very low material uh, per unit, uh, of course, of energy. Uh, generated. So this is tons per terawatt hour. And the materials used here are cement, glass, concrete, steel, and other materials. And you can see how nuclear stacks up to uh, under energy technologies. It turns out that fossil plants are also fairly material efficient in that sense. This excludes the fuel, obviously. It's just sort of the, the materials used for the construction of the plant. And by comparison, the uh, uh, some of the renewables are, again, orders of magnitude. Uh, higher, which all of it, of course, stems from the from the fact that the energy density of nuclear is is uh, dramatically higher than than virtually any other energy source that we know of. Now, waste, of course, is a traditionally an issue with nuclear, and there is no denying that the longevity and toxicity of of spent fuel certainly are concerns. Uh, I think most of the audience here will be aware that, from a technical point of view, there are several solutions. Some are being implemented worldwide, uh, one in the US as well, which is dry cask, very safe and even relatively relatively cheap. But one thing that is often lost on, on people is the uh, amount of uh, waste that uh, nuclear, particularly high level waste that uh, nuclear energy uh, produces compared again to other low carbon energy sources. These uh, uh, figures that are shown here come from the International Renewable Energy Agency, and they show the projected, this is projected, 
uh, total waste from nuclear, wind, and solar. And nuclear, you can barely see there at the bottom compared to the other two. Now, it's very, very different nature of the waste that is being produced. Uh, for solar, it is toxic. It's not radioactive, but it contains uh, lead and, and other carcinogenic um, elements like chromium. And uh, at least to date, has either been abandoned in the field when you know when the panels are no longer working, or is going to go into lead fin, uh, into landfills. I, I suspect that between now and 2050, there will be some recycling mechanisms, so the problem might not be as daunting as this plot show. But just the sheer amount of of uh, material that has to be processed, or the waste that has to be processed for solar and wind, is is orders of magnitude higher than nuclear. I like this. Um, this uh, sort of little factoid at the bottom that has just appeared at the slide here, uh, because this you will remember. So if a person um, spent or uses only nuclear energy or nuclear electricity throughout his or her lifetime, uh, the amount of high level waste that is generated would fit essentially in, in a little cup that is shown there. So once again, that's the starting point. It is nasty stuff. It's very, very long lived and it's highly toxic, but the, the volumes are, are small. Um, now, low impact on public health, this is not a particularly cheerful way to look at uh, uh, public health impact, but it's a rational way to look at it. These are literally uh, fatalities per uh, uh, unit electricity generated by different energy sources. And so the, the units are odd. It's 100,000 deaths per trillion of kilowatt hours. And not surprisingly, you see coal, oil, and even gas uh, have showing big numbers here, mostly associated with respiratory diseases that come from the particulate and other uh, uh, noxious pollutants that are emitted when there is combustion of uh, oil, coal, and, and natural gas. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, renewables and, and, also, and also nuclear. And, and again, in the case of nuclear, you gotta include both calculated as well as uh, real documented uh, fatalities. And it, when all that is included, the figure is very, very low. Now, of course, this does not address perceptions, does not address you know, public psychology and all of that, but these are sort of the numbers. Now, uh, I, I will focus primarily in the, in the coming slides on the uh, contribution that nuclear can provide going forward uh, to the effort of decarbonization. But it's important to realize that nuclear is already now uh, frankly, the backbone of the clean energy infrastructure in several important regions of the world. What is shown here is the share or percentage of carbon-free electricity. So this does not include uh, uh, fossil fuels. It only includes nuclear hydro and solar and wind and other renewables because those are carbon-free. And you can see that roughly half of the world's carbon-free electricity comes from hydro, about 30% from nuclear, about 20% from solar. In the US, however, it's about 50% from nuclear and then roughly the same from hydro and other renewables. In places like China, mostly hydro, in the EU, quite similar to the US. And then what you see all the way to the right is the Republic of Korea. I gave a similar presentation a few months back in Korea. That's why the data are there. And you see in a place like Korea, which relies heavily on nuclear, roughly 80 plus, 85 plus percent of their carbon-free electricity comes from nuclear. So already big, big footprint uh, in our clean energy infrastructure. Now the trends, however, are different in different regions of the world. We see uh, new nuclear capacity being deployed in places like China, India, Russia, the Middle East, roughly half of the world economy. However, declining in places like Western Europe, Japan, and to an extent also in, in the United States. Um, in this slide, I'm going to show the uh, data for Europe. Europe is an interesting uh, experiment, if you wish, or lab, because it's, as you know, over 20 countries, uh, more or less interconnected in terms of the power grid, and each one with its own different um, energy policy. So you can do uh, you know, one on one comparison to see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, the data that I'm going to show here came from a, um, uh, a study done about five years ago in, in Europe. And uh, the first plot there shows the share of uh, effectively wind and solar, so non-hydro renewables in, in Europe and over a period of one year. In that period, uh, about 20% of electricity in Europe came from wind and solar. And uh, there were six, six countries at or above that uh, percentage. And I, I hope you can read them there. There are Denmark, Ireland, Germany, Portugal, Spain, 
and Finland. By, by definition, those are countries that have heavily invested in solar and wind capacity, and they're getting about 20% or higher of their electricity from these energy sources. What I'm going to show you next is a plot of the same 20 plus countries, but now they're going to be ordered according to their carbon footprint. So the carbon footprint of their power sector. So if you're in the business of decarbonization, what you care about is not what capacity you have installed. What you care about is the amount of CO2 that you're emitting into the atmosphere per unit electricity generated. So here they are, same countries, but now ordered in uh, carbon footprint. So obviously the low number here is good and that high number here is bad. So grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, the six countries that have the cleanest um, energy sector, excuse me, power grid in Europe are Norway, Sweden, France, Switzerland, Finland and Belgium. With the exception of Finland, which shows up in both groups here, the other, uh, there is basically no correlation between, between these two groups. Note, by the way, that some countries that are in the first group, a high solar and wind, happen to be either in the uh, sort of middle bunch or even on the right end, which is you know, high, uh, high carbon intensity uh, in the bottom graph. And so what do these six countries have in common, the ones in the, in the green square? Well, they either, have heavy hydro or heavy nuclear or a combination of both. So for example, Norway, it's almost like 100% hydro. Sweden is roughly half hydro, half nuclear. France is primarily nuclear. Switzerland, again, half and half. Uh, Finland, a lot, of, uh, a lot of nuclear and a little bit of biomass, actually. And Belgium, mostly nuclear. So this is not to say that, of course, solar and wind should not be deployed. They are being deployed in the marketplace. That's a fact. Uh, in fact, we need, we need more of those. But the point is, historically, the decarbonization of the power grid in a place like Europe is actually correlated primarily with nuclear and hydro and, uh, and, and it has worked. So I think the name of the game here is add solar and wind to nuclear and hydro, not instead of not replacing uh, nuclear, and, nuclear and hydro, that's the message. So that's the, um, the situation now. The question is, do we need nuclear to deeply decarbonize the power sector? And the emphasis here is on the word deeply. It's fairly straightforward to reduce emissions in the power sector a little bit by phasing out coal, replacing with natural gas, a little bit of renewables. The emissions come down. But if we're serious about decar deep decarbonization, we need to go to 90% reduction or even higher than that. Those anyway are the targets that have been set by the, um, by the climatologists in order to basically uh, keep the uh, uh, rise of the temperature of the earth to 1.5 or 2 degrees. See. So at MIT, we've been doing a lot of modeling of uh, the power sector in different, in different regions of the world. Uh, here I'm going to show one in, in China, which is quite representative, but we looked at Europe, we look at different regions of the US. And, and what does this modeling um, uh, consist of? So it's a, uh, we take a, a region of the world, like a country uh, or a region of the United States, and for that region, we look at the hourly uh, demand in electricity, so 8,760 entries. We look at the hourly weather patterns, which basically determine how much solar and wind you're going to have at that particular time of, of the day throughout the year. Um, and then we have to input the cost of the different energy sources, uh, the different power plants, and also how quickly they can come online and follow the load. And so the code, which is called Gen X, and at this point has been validated uh, multiple times, uh, basically crunches all these numbers, all these input together, and it outputs a, an optimal generation mix, where by optimal here we mean a generation mix that minimizes the average cost of electricity in that market over the, over, the, over the course of one year. So the figure of merit, which is shown here on the y-axis, is dollars per megawatt hour. And then we can run this, uh, this model for that particular region of the world for different uh, decarbonization targets. So again, the figure of merit here is now grams per kilowatt hour. That's the x-axis. And uh, currently, the world is at around 500 grams per kilowatt hour. And we need to go down to less than 50 or preferably less than 10. Um, now, we can run this model for scenarios in which nuclear is artificially excluded. So we say, OK, we try to do the decarbonization uh, with everything else but nuclear. Or we can include nuclear in nominal cost. And of course, we can also include it 
at lower cost. So now if you look at that plot, what does it show? This region is fairly um, northern latitude. It doesn't have very favorable renewables. It is in China, relatively expensive natural gas. So the model basically shows that if you're trying to decarbonize without nuclear, which is the blue bars there, uh, rapidly the average cost of electricity in that market is gonna escalate by factor of two or a factor of three. If on the other end, you keep nuclear in the mix, those are the scenarios where you have orange and, and gray bars, the uh, average cost of electricity stays more or less constant. And the question is why? Um, well, it has to do with the plots that are shown here on the right, and I realize that the, you know, the figures are hard to read here, but the bottom line is that if you are trying to decarbonize without nuclear, uh, you are left with solar, wind, uh, hydro, if you have it there, and then because of the intermittency of solar and wind, you basically have to deploy also a lot of uh, energy storage so that you can meet the demand uh, when the demand exists, not just when you get, you know, the the, uh, the energy from from renewable sources. So the plot at the bottom right there shows the install capacity, the amount of equipment, the amount of power plants that you have to basically build as a function of again the emissions, so grams per kilowatt hour, for scenarios in which nuclear is excluded. And you see that there is an escalation of the install capacity by a factor of ten by the time you go from a, a hundred grams of per kilowatt hour down to, to one. And so you have to overbuild your system dramatically to cope with that intermittency. Both you overbuild the solar and wind capacity as well as you have to deploy all these massive amount of, of uh, effectively batteries, uh, lithium, uh, lithium ion batteries or some other form of energy storage. By contrast, the bottom right um, plot shows the install capacity for the same region as a function of the emissions if you have nuclear in the mix. And nuclear here is shown in the, uh, it, it, with, the, with, the yellow, with the yellow color there. And you can see that here the, uh, the, 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 the install capacity stays more or less constant. And it has to do with the fact that nuclear only is low carbon, but it's also dispatchable. So it can be used to uh, effectively fill the peaks and valleys created by the intermittency of the renewable. So, what this model shows is that really a combination of nuclear, which is carbon free and dispatchable, and solar and wind, which are carbon free but intermittent, is the ideal way to go. Not either or, but a combination of both. Um, so as part of a study that I, I led a few years back on the future of nuclear, we also looked at the scalability of different energy sources. And the uh, figure of merit or the metric that we decided to use here was average added kilowatt hour per capita per year. This is effectively a measure of growth, of how quickly you can put uh, new uh, uh, capacity or new, excuse me, uh, kilowatt hour actually, which means basically not just capacity, but also actual energy generated uh, per unit time. And so historically, nuclear has scaled very, very quickly uh, in the uh, 70s and the 80s in Sweden and France uh, at the rates that are shown here. In the US, not as much, but it has outpaced, again, historically, natural gas, coal, and also renewables. Now, whether this um, scaling rates are reproducible now with you know, current regulations and different contexts uh, with the lack of maturity of the supply chain, uh, in the nuclear industry, particularly in the West, uh, remains to be seen. But again, this at least gives us historical confidence that, that nuclear can scale up quickly and actually quicker than other energy sources when, when the demand is there and, and the will to do it is there. Okay, so what does the context look like for nuclear in the US? Um, I mentioned this at the beginning. There is there is support, and it's interesting because there is support from many different sort of directions. Um, climatologists, very prominent climatologists in the US and worldwide have come out saying that there is really no credible path to climate stabilization if one does not include a substantial amount of, of nuclear energy in the, in the energy mix going forward. That's quite powerful coming from folks that are not necessarily energy experts, but they understand the dynamics of, of, of climate change and how much um, CO2 we can tolerate and how quickly we have to scale up 
uh, in order to address that problem. Uh, you also have very prominent, uh, uh, you know, businessman like Bill Gates. He has invested uh, personally in in nuclear. You might have heard just last week they announced that uh, uh, their pilot plant for the so-called natrium concept will actually be deployed in in Wyoming. Um, you have uh, historically skeptical organizations like the Union of Concerned Scientists, which have come out publicly saying that, well, uh, you know, we don't know about expanding nuclear, but the existing fleet certainly is an asset, is valuable. It, as I showed you early, uh, produces about 50% of our carbon-free electricity should be preserved. Um, and then, interestingly, we have uh, both parties that, for slightly different reasons, have, have uh, expressed uh, support uh, for nuclear, both existing and new nuclear. And I say for different reasons because truly are different. I think on the left you have, on, for the Democrats you have support uh, for nuclear, mostly stemming from the desire to use nuclear as part of the decarbonization effort. Um, and from the right is for the uh, business opportunities that nuclear can afford and also the technical leadership as well as the geopolitical value that nuclear energy can have uh, for the United States. Now, in parallel with that support, there is uh, there seems to be a robust interest also from private uh, capital, not only from uh, from government, which is started to spend again on nuclear, but uh, also some private capital. And there are about 70 advanced nuclear projects in North America. Now, to be clear, not all of these are equally credible, and probably 10% of this will be uh, will become realities or will be successful. But the fact that there is such a um, uh, brisk and enthusiastic activity certainly is a good sign for nuclear, and it's not confined to the usual to the usual suspects, the large companies, traditional companies like Westinghouse and, and uh, General Electric or Framaton that we're used to. Now you cannot read this one, but this is an example of uh, legislation and other uh, initiatives uh, that are primarily in, in the in the federal or the state governments that are meant to support uh, new nuclear. And again, most of this legislation in Congress has been passed. In fact, all of this legislation in Congress has been passed with bipartisan with bipartisan support. So the context is positive. At least the political context is positive. The uh, economic context is not that positive. It's it's a big challenge. And so this is a good segue into the next section of my presentation, which is why do we need innovation? Well, the current business model, I would argue, for new nuclear in the US and Western Europe is economically unattractive. What does that business model look like? Well, in order to bring a new nuclear technology to market, it takes very, very long time for testing and licensing that is required to actually deploy these things. Um, it is based on field construction, and construction sites are notoriously inefficient, our low productivity environments. We've seen this not just for nuclear projects actually, but for other large infrastructure uh, projects. They tend to be behind uh, schedule and to, and, and to uh, incur cost overruns uh, in nuclear in particular, but like I said a minute ago, not only in nuclear. Um, and then uh, the traditional model is uh, gigawatt scale, gigawatt scale plants. And ultimately, they tend to be connected to the electric grid, which is uh, a commodity market. So once the electrons are on the grid, there is really no uh, distinction uh, from where those electrons come from. So it's hard to command a premium uh, for, uh, for nuclear in that, uh, in that environment. <laughs> OK, so uh, with that in mind, I would argue that uh, uh, nuclear deployment paradigm has to shift to smaller serial manufacturer systems with an accelerated testing and licensing and producing also higher added energy value products that electricity than electricity for, for the grid. So I'm going to now walk you through this, um, this sort of shifting paradigm, uh, paradigm uh, one, uh, one bullet at a time. By the way, let me check. Can, can people hear me and, and follow clearly? I... Edith, Ann, can you guys hear me? You're good, Jacopo. And <laughs> okay. I've got a lot of great questions coming in that I'm collecting for you. OK, very good. I can either pause now and take them a few or wait until the end. Um, Let's maybe... wait till the end. OK, very good. All right, so smaller machines. I think the industry gets it in the US and, uh, and 
to a lesser extent maybe in, in Europe. Um, here it's all about essentially reducing the number and scope and complexity of nuclear system structure and, and components. Uh, that in turn will reduce the cost and time for design of engineering. And very, very importantly, uh, will dramatically reduce the cost and schedule of a demonstration project, that all important first project that can uh, provide confidence that the technology is viable, not only technically, but also economically. So just to get a little bit more quantitative, a new large light water reactor is based on our experience in the Western world, uh, cost of the order of $10 billion, it takes about 10 years. Now, let me be clear, this is not the case in China, in South Korea, in Russia, uh, in India, they've been they've been much much better building uh, large light water reactors for a fraction of this money and half of the time. So routinely, we see new nuclear power plants in in China, for example, being built in five years on time uh, for a fraction of ten billion dollars. I think the latest estimate I have is that it cost about twenty two thousand twenty five hundred dollars per kilowatt so that would translate for a thousand megawatt to about 2.5 billion dollars so a factor of four lower than what we're seeing in the west but in the west we've seen these horrendously long projects with big cost overruns now if you go to small modular reactors um, which are meant to be mostly factory uh, manufacturer but also with some construction on site more streamlined and all of that. The expectation is that a single module, depending on the power, depending on the design, might cost of the order of a billion dollars and might take five years. So that's now an order of magnitude down in investment. And then all the way to the right, you have micro reactors, particularly portable micro reactors. The expectation there is that the magnitude of the initial investment would be an order of magnitude lower than the previous one. So now you are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And because this would be fully factory, manuf uh, factory manufactured, fabricated with essentially no on-site construction, they could be built much, much faster. In my opinion, three years, which is shown there, is actually a very, very conservative estimate. This could literally be cranked out the same way that, for example, jet engines are, are, are built in, in factories this day roughly similar scale, roughly, roughly similar complexity. So let me start with the small modular reactors. Uh, there are many different designs. Most of them tend to be miniaturized version of the traditional light water reactor technologies that we're used to. The, uh, the example shown here is for the GE product, uh, the BWRX 300, so 300 megawatts. It is essentially a smaller version of their um, simplified boiling water reactor, which was about 600 megawatts. Uh, so a smaller version, but done in a smart way. Uh, first of all, at 300 megawatt, it can directly replace many coal and natural gas plant uh, that will be uh, that will be retired. Uh, a gigawatt scale plant would not be able to do that or would, would not be able to use the existing infrastructure in terms of transmission or cooling or administrative buildings and so on. Um, the target overnight construction cost is very ambitious. And we don't know if actually that target is going to be is going to be met but it's the right target it has to be of the order of 2500 or less dollars per kilowatt that translates to an lcoe levelized cost of electricity of less than 50 dollars per megawatt hour that's actually that would be very competitive if it is dispatchable the way nuclear is uh 50 dollars per megawatt hour is actually quite attractive today it can deploy in smaller increments and it's designed for frequent uh, load following, which again is required given the variability of generation on the grid now. Uh, very often, uh, these are below grade design, which enhance physical security. Uh, if it is LWR based, it's based on very well known proven technology. And there is the nice uh, perk that uh, Western suppliers seem to be in the lead. I think that lead will not last for long. It's I just read today that the China has announced that they will build they will build their first SMR, a small modular reactor, uh, 150 megawatt in the next few years. So if we don't wake up, we're going to lose that uh, that lead. But for now, I think the U.S. Uh, has has some very interesting designs. Now, the innovations that can make a difference in terms of cost, I would say across all these different uh, designs, whether it's an SMR or large reactors, are shown here. First, the experience shows that standardization at multi-unit sites, if you build the same reactor over and over again, particularly if you build it at the same site using the same workforce, uh, the cost does come down. Uh, 
this has been seen in recent uh, projects in Abu Dhabi, but even interestingly enough, at, at the Vogel site, unit four is costing a lot less than unit three. And I'm saying interesting because certainly that, that project is not an example of you know, economically attractive project, but even with such a small sample, two units, the second unit costs less than the first unit. So build more uh, at, of the same at the same site, that seems to be a no brainer. Um, concrete, the cost of reinforced concrete is associated with a large share of the cost of, of the site. And the uh, traditional reinforced concrete uh, structures are cumbersome and multi-step processes. And there are now technologies like uh, steel plate composites or steel bricks that can reduce the uh, time and cost and labor associated with, with reinforced concrete. So those should be explored. And then interestingly, there is a uh, high productivity environment is a, is a shipyard and it's possible to actually integrate uh, nuclear reactors in floating structures or platforms or barges. And, and then being delivered in one piece, essentially, to a, to a, to a site. Um, and so that also has some, uh, uh, some interesting economy of, of scales that can be, that can be um, exploited. And finally, modular construction, again, in factories and shipyards can play, can play a role here. So everything that shifts labor, essentially, from, the, from a construction site to a high productivity environment like factories and shipyards has the potential to reduce to reduce cost, and this is what it says here, with the additional benefits of shortening the construction schedule, which reduces the interest during construction. Um, in other industries like chemical plants or even nuclear submarines, these uh, innovations or these approaches, I should call them, have reduced uh, capital cost in the range of 10 to 50%. So this is you know, potentially very, very attractive also for, for civilian nuclear energy. Now, a little bit more extreme is um, nuclear batteries. And, and this is essentially portable micro reactors. Now you're talking about very, very small systems. You can see an example in, in, this, uh, in this slide here. So now the uh, power output, whether it's heat, electricity, or a combination of both is 20 megawatt. Of course, it's always carbon free because that's nuclear. They're being designed to be dry cool so that you're not at the mercy of you know, being next to a lake or, or, or the ocean. Uh, they just use the atmosphere for, for cooling. Um, they're standardized design, entirely built in a factory. They are transported to the site in a container. Again, you can see the scale in, in, this, uh, in this image here. Uh, they're meant to be plug and play connections. So instead of taking months, let alone years, to uh, get your energy once the, the plant comes to the site or once the reactor comes to the site, you get it in days or weeks. So that's what we call plug and play. Uh, because of economic uh, reasons, it has to be essentially an autonomous or semi-autonomous machine. You cannot afford to have dozens of operators on site. And frankly, you don't need to. I mean, the work that we're doing at MIT and, and many other organizations are working on this shows that uh, systems of this size and this simplicity can be um, remotely monitored, but basically being autonomous in terms of uh, uh, not needing uh, operators on site. Um, Interestingly, the refueling here is not done on site. So the uh, customer does not have to either handle or store radioactive material on site. The refueling is done off site five, every five or 10 years. So the, the whole thing is shipped back to a central facility where it's refurbished and refueled and then reused either at the same site or a different site. So the model that, we, that people are exploring for these nuclear batteries is essentially a fleet model as opposed to a number of power plants that are fixed in place. You have, you have a fleet of identical batteries and you just rotate them wherever, wherever they're needed. Um, part of the value proposition for these nuclear batteries is once again, the very, very small footprint compared to alternative uh, low carbon uh, technologies, that little green rectangle that you can barely see in, this, in, in these images would be the size of a 10 megawatt nuclear battery. And you can compare that to a wind, to a, to a wind uh, turbine or to a solar farm of comparable capacity. Once you factor in the capacity factor, uh, it is even more attractive. Now, all these reactors, whether they are uh, small modular reactors or they are nuclear batteries, uh, they have an exceptionally uh, robust safety profile. Uh, it, for nuclear safety, it's all about achieving, you know, three functions. The first is shut down the reactor uh, and keep it, uh, you know, uh, subcritical, uh, and then remove the, the decay heat, remove the residual heat uh, after shutdown, and finally prevent a, a 
uh, radioactivity release uh, in case of an accident. And in, in the case of these advanced reactors, these three functions are achieved without any need for external intervention. And what I mean by external intervention is either an operator manually having to act to, to actuate any systems or um, the need for external energy sources like uh, diesel generators or pumps. So it's all done uh, based on inherent safety attributes. The fact that, for example, very often the, 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 the coolant doesn't boil off. This would be the case for high temperature gas reactors or micro reactors, or the fuel form is so robust that it can really retain the, the fission products up to extremely high temperatures, or the core has a very high thermal capacity, et cetera, et cetera. Those are what we call inherent safety attributes. And then combine that with uh, safety engineer safety systems that are passive. And therefore, again, they don't need you know, external energy sources to function. The implication of the safety approach is that accidents uh, categories or accident categories like TMI, Chernobyl, and Fukushima are essentially eliminated by design. They, they almost physically cannot happen in this system. And the second very, very important uh, uh, implication or consequence is there, the emergency planning zone with the associated evacuation plan and all of that is limited to side boundaries. So effectively population living near these, uh, these new plants would not have to be evacuated should there be a uh, should there be an accident that's i think very very important for the social acceptability of of new nuclear as well as um important uh, economic implications because emergency planning does cost money even when it's not used now the uh the, the safety profile really can accelerate the testing and licensing quite dramatically and uh, it, because it allows you to effectively do a licensing by testing. I don't particularly love that phrase, but the idea here is that you can test a technology at full scale because these machines are very small and you can put it through a testing program that directly shows you that the, uh, um, that the, that, that, that the system behaves as you expect and the limits for uh, fuel temperature, cladding temperature, pressures, et cetera, et cetera, are met. And you do that by, by direct demonstration. So this was done, for example, by NASA and Los Alamos. They designed, fabricated, and tested a micro reactor, less than one megawatt, for space applications in less than three, in three years, 2015 to 2018, and total cost of less than $20 million. Now, they leveraged, the actual cost was higher than $20 million because they leveraged a lot of existing DOE infrastructure. Uh, things like the fuel came free and things of that type. But nonetheless, that's what the DOE is here for. And so even for commercial applications, that infrastructure can be leveraged for the initial demonstration, uh, for the initial demonstration projects. So the last leg of that paradigm shift that I, that I advocate uh, for is uh, higher, higher added value. Uh, or, uh, uh, for uh, nuclear products. And this can come either from a strong policy signal that recognizes the special nature of, of nuclear in terms of being carbon free, good economic impact and energy security, et cetera. Um, you know, up to a year ago when I gave these presentations, I would call that unlikely. The current administration, at least here in the US makes this a little bit more likely, but it's certainly beyond our control. Um, alternatively, you can try to capture new markets in which nuclear products do sell at a premium or can sell at a premium. And so I think this is within reach with the right technology. And I would argue that particularly these portable micro reactors, but also the small modular reactors are the right technology. So this is what I call beyond the grid. And I'm coming to the end of the presentation here. Um, why beyond the grid? Uh, the electric grid actually accounts for about a quarter of uh, greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. And three quarters are not associated with electricity, uh, with electricity production. They're associated with things like um, uh, factories or transportation or buildings or agriculture. So if we're serious about decarbonizing the energy sector or decarbonizing our economy, we need to reduce emissions in all these different sectors. Now, granted, uh, subgroup of uh, activities within these sectors can be electrified and therefore reconnected back to a grid. And then that grid has to be decarbonized. But there are many applications that, that really are hard to electrify. And so they have to be decarbonized more directly. 
So for these nuclear batteries, which are portable and they can be co-located with, uh, with a, a variety of um, applications, the sky is the limit. Every sector of the economy uh, can basically benefit from having nuclear batteries co-located at their sites. Uh, if it's electricity that they need, things like desalination or flood protection or hydrogen electrolyzer or data centers or aquaculture or freight ship propulsion or EV coal charging stations, nuclear batteries can be co-located there. But even bigger is the market associated with heat or combined heat and power. But there are some applications that just require heat. There are factories and chemical plants that require minimal amount of electricity, and most of them require heat at certain temperatures. So again, uh, nuclear batteries or even small modular reactors can, can, uh, can serve those needs. Uh, district heating or microgrids, particularly for remote locations, uh, military bases, or even indoor farm. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the appeal of, of uh, this model is that co-locating nuclear batteries or micro reactors with the end users effectively eliminates the need for um, big infrastructure associated with energy storage, transmission, and distribution. So not everything has to go through the grid. You can co-locate energy sources and energy users, and that saves a lot of money. And frankly, you can even create uh, uh, or build in a lot more resilience into the system because you're not at the mercy of single failure, uh, single failure um, events. Now we've looked at uh, what these potential heat applications uh, could look like. This example is in the state of Washington. I did a study with PNNL on this uh, just a few months back, and uh, we, we identified a uh, over a hundred. This is just a subset. Over a hundred sites just in the state of Washington that could use order of you know ten megawatts of heat, uh, roughly twenty four seven. And this would displace if it came from nuclear. Uh, it would displace a lot of CO two. And you can see here very mundane. Uh, applications like uh, food processing or, or, or paper meals. This is not particularly high tech, but they need a lot of energy and they're currently burning natural gas. And so again, the idea here is would be to replace those natural gas boilers with, with co-located micro reactors. In the transportation sector alone, uh, in order to decarbonize, you either go with hydrogen, which implies obviously um, uh, than the use of fuel cell vehicles, or you electrify, which means electric vehicles. Either way, you're going to require a lot of primary energy input because neither electricity nor hydrogen are energy sources, they're energy currencies. And so you can see the numbers here and pick your favorite region. For the US, if you were to electrify the entire transportation sector, it would require an additional 285 gigawatt of electricity. It's a massive amount of electricity. And if you were to do it with hydrogen, and do high temperature electrolysis to generate hydrogen from cracking from, from, from water, from cracking water, it will require even more electricity and heat. So the opportunities here for nuclear are large. Now, realistically, nuclear will not capture most of this uh, market, but even if it catches, uh, capture, excuse me, 10 or 20%, it would be a very, very big expansion of, of nuclear going forward. I'm going to close my talk by telling you a little bit more quantitatively what the cost targets ought to be for nuclear in these different markets. So for heat, the main competition is natural gas fire boilers. If uh, we are in a carbon constrained world, uh, uh, burning natural gas will either incur a carbon tax or some form of carbon penalty, or it will have to do carbon capture and sequestration. Either way, you add a certain amount of dollars per ton of CO2. And so what's shown here in the plot is the cost of heat coming from natural gas, excluding the cost of the boiler. So this is just the fuel, but including the cost of a carbon tax. And so you can see there that in order to compete with that energy source for heat, uh, a, a uh, nuclear um, system would have to basically generate heat at about 20 to $50 per megawatt hour, which is equivalent to six to $15 per million BTU, uh, which is a reasonable target. Now for electricity, uh, the competition for dispatchable electricity, such as nuclear, is gonna be natural gas. And here, the same idea uh, applies. If you cannot um, capture that uh, CO2, you're gonna be slapped with a carbon tax. And you can be either on the grid or you can be distributed. You can see the different plots here. So NGCC would be a natural gas combined cycle. That would be the grid or distributed natural gas. And, uh, and you can see the plots for both no carbon tax and $100 uh, per ton of carbon tax. And so the levelized cost of electricity 
in this case, the target would be between 70 and $115 per megawatt hour, which again is quite, quite reasonable uh, for new nuclear applications. So we're back to the takeaway messages, which I'm not gonna reread, but those are the five points that I would like you guys to take away. And at this point, I'm gonna uh, give it back to, to Anne and see if we have time and for questions. Thank you so much, Jacopo. Uh, a reminder for alumni viewers, thank you for the questions you've already submitted. Uh, please submit more in the Q&A future. Uh, and we'll, I'll go to the ones that are upvoted here uh, that you'd like to hear discussed. So Jacopo, we've got a lot of questions and not a lot of time. The, the highly rated questions are on a couple of themes, uh, how fission systems interact with or are synergistic with other energy systems, how to move the needle on public opinion. And I also have a list of technical questions on nuclear batteries and advanced fission systems. Uh, which, which would you like first? Well, let's go in the order you mentioned them. So how do they integrate with other energy systems? Uh, very okay. well. In fact, uh, one of the slides I show you where we did that modeling, uh, and I show you a region of China for which we did that modeling, the Gen X modeling, uh, that actually um, uh, uh, shows that the best approach to decarbonize is to have both nuclear and renewables. And it's done in a way that really looks at the hourly variation of demand and generation. And so it takes into account the fact that at times when there is a very, very high generation of say solar and wind because the weather is favorable, nuclear would have to follow the load. And that's all within the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, acceptable technical specs for both existing nuclear power plants and even more for new nuclear power plants, which are designed with those load following capabilities in mind. So I think they can be integrated very easily. Also our colleague here in, uh, in NSC, Charles Forsberg has been working a lot in terms of uh, what he calls hybrid systems, which is exactly the integration of nuclear with solar and wind. Now with industrial activities, maybe located geographically in a certain region and seeing how you can leverage, you know, high cost, low cost of electricity and dispatchability versus intermittency to realize an economically optimum uh, uh, mix. No, thank you for that. And so in addition to complementing renewables, um, storage systems become important, batteries or hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, can you quickly comment on, on the role fission plays uh, together with those storage systems? Yeah, so I, I, I personally think that the best storage medium is, uh, is or the best way to store energy is not to store it as electricity because batteries cost a lot of money, although their, their cost is coming down, but you know, even optimistic, uh, uh, estimates are still much higher than the alternative, which is heat. So I think uh, that the best way to store energy in an integrated system is to store it as heat. And, and that favors nuclear, frankly, because, well, nuclear reactors are heat sources. So to the extent that you can deploy a, uh, um, a, a, a series of tanks of a, uh, a thermal fluid next to the reactor, and that can uh, uh, basically allow you to store energy and then dispatch it uh, to the grid while operating the, um, the reactor always at 100% power. In fact, this scheme that I've just described is, uh, is the TerraPower Natrium uh, approach. And so that's exactly what they're going to do. They have a reactor that operates always at 100% power, but instead of generating directly electricity, dumps that energy, that heat into a, uh, a thermal storage system and then that thermal storage system is coupled with a power conversion cycle that provides electricity to the grid on demand, so uh, so it, it it works it works very well in that sense. There are other folks that are looking also at using, as you said, in uh, hydrogen and uh, um, you didn't say, but I'm going to say maybe synthetic fuels, other fuels production as a way to store energy. And I like that scheme as well. But people have to keep in mind that uh, the uh, plants that actually generate or that produce hydrogen or those synthetic fuels are high capital cost, which means they also should be operated 100% of the time continuously. And if you have an energy source that uh, an energy input that is uh, varied because of other economic considerations, then the economics of hydrogen generation or synthetic fuel generation would suffer. So, so it's not trivial to come up with the optimum there, but that's a very, very, uh, very good question. Okay. And the last question in this theme that was also very highly voted um, has to do with trade-offs or interplay between nuclear fission and fusion. Should fusion have a breakout in the next 10 years as proven and deployable? 
Yeah, so I, obviously the more tools we have in the toolkit, the better. I th I, and I, I hope this message came across clearly. It's not an either or, it's an end end game. You want to push on every, every technology that can get you to the finish line. And so to the extent that Fusion can contribute within you know, within within the time that is required, that, that would be a very, very welcome uh, addition. You know, we, we know that the fusion has some uh, uh, characteristics that make it uh, more attractive, certainly more socially acceptable than, than fission. And so again, if, you know, if that technology is demonstrated, I think it will be a natural addition to the, uh, you know, to, to, to the market here. That's a great segue to the next series of very highly rated uh, questions and comments in the chat here from our alumni, which is, what's your opinion on how we move the needle on public opinion uh, for fission nuclear energy? There's still a lot of strong public suspicion and issue of not in my backyard. Um, how, where do you think we go from here? Yeah, first of all, let me tell you, this is the big question, right? I mean, we can solve, as engineers, we can solve technical <laughs> issues a lot simpler than solving perceptions and, and uh, engaging with the public. Uh, in fact, I, I, I even read research that uh, claims that, uh, uh, you know, the way our brain engineers and scientists brain is wired is inherently counter uh, to uh, efficiency and effectiveness in communicating and engaging with uh, with vast majority of the population. But having said that, I'm, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic for a number of reasons. Uh, from a technical point of view, the technologies are becoming a lot more robust, and that's certainly good news. You know, you can tell people with a straight face, hey, you know, an accident like Fukushima, an accident like Chernobyl, an accident like TMI uh, cannot happen or is much less likely to happen. However, that approach typically doesn't cut it in the public debate. And, and what you really need is... Um, is a different engagement uh, approach. And so uh, people tend to uh, uh, communicate well or engage well when there is shared values, when there is trust. And so what we need to create is trust. And so that means not just the message, but the messengers have to change. Uh, fewer folks from uh, from industry or even from academia, more from uh, you know uh, the workers from the plants uh, or more environmentalists. I think the messengers, matter really, really a lot here. And so hearing from folks like that, uh, that nuclear is needed, particularly pushing the value proposition, not starting the conversation always from, oh, let me explain how safe nuclear is, or let me tell you that waste is not a problem. No, you should always start with the value proposition. Why are we even messing with this technology? It's just why I started my presentation telling you, you know, all the wonderful things that we can do with nuclear. And then obviously we need to address the issue. So I'm not sure I'm giving a coherent answer here. It's certainly a very tough problem, but um, it's a combination of new technologies. They look different. You know, if you think about these nuclear batteries, they look different, they feel different. That might be uh, a, a good conversation opener, but then it has to be built on, on shared values and trust. Absolutely. So I think that we might not have time to dig into more technical ones. I know you have a hard stop at, at one, Jacopo. So, so let me promise that we will get the alumni some of the answers to the more interesting technical ones. We'll work with Jacopo offline and push those to you. Thank you for the, the great questions and comments in the, in the Q&A here. Uh, so I think we should um, really say on behalf of the Alumni Association, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, to this MIT Faculty Forum online broadcast. And thank you, Professor Buongiorno. Thank you, Jacopo, for joining us today. Uh, again, we'll forward all the questions via the Q&A uh, to Jacopo and our alumni office staff. And the chat window is going to be here open for discussion purposes for another 15 minutes if, if people want to uh, chat with each other. And this broadcast will be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel uh, within a week. So thank you, everyone, again, for participating today. And we'll and, see you all soon. And, and, and thank you, and for moderate. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.